Richard Hatcher, tell us first, how big do you think the threat from coronavirus now is around the world? Well, I, I think the, the threat is very significant. Uh, the potential of the virus, it's already demonstrated in China. Yeah, I think it's demonstrating that potential in Italy, in Iran. Uh, there were three cases identified in Italy two weeks ago. Yesterday, there were over 3,000. I, th I think um, there are many epidemiologists who talk about the potential of the virus in terms of, of attack rates globally that could be between 50 and 70 percent of the global population. And when you talk about those Italy figures, looking at what's happening here in the UK, are we on a similar trajectory? Well, I, I'm, I, I don't like to make predictions. I, I, I think talking about the potential of the virus is important so that you can understand how dangerous a threat it is. I think it's up to societies how they will respond to the virus. An example that I've been talking about a lot, people have, some people are skeptical about China's reports of declining cases. WHO just came back from a two-week commission. They were very impressed with the Chinese response. They believe the Chinese numbers. But even if you don't believe the Chinese numbers, you can look at places like Singapore and Hong Kong. Singapore had its first case on January 23rd. Yesterday, they had gotten up to, I think, about 115 cases. So fewer than the UK. Fewer than the UK over six weeks. And, and basically, they have been able, through their public health interventions, through the public health response, through contact tracing, isolation of cases, and through engaging the public, they have been able to keep the virus under control. So I would say it's up to us how we respond to the virus. I don't want to say that we will be like Italy. Uh, I, I do think it's important to recognize the virus is here, and it, and it has tremendous potential um, to, to you know, be disruptive and, and to cause high rates of illness and even high rates of death. But that is not a future that is locked in. Well, given the rate of increase that we're seeing now in the UK, so what does the government now need to do? Well, I, 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 the, the contact tracing is very important. The, the voluntary quarantine of contacts is very important. The isolation of cases is very important. I think there may be a time to close schools. Uh, other societies... The government seems to be backing away from that a bit. Other societies that, that have responded aggressively have undertaken that intervention. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of controversy about school closure right now for, because it's very unclear what's happening with school children. With flu, for example, we know that schools are amplification points within society. It's very clear that attack rates of flu are much higher in children than they are in adults or, or certainly in the elderly. Children have been minimally affected by COVID-19. What's unclear is whether they've been infected and just handled the infections well or whether they actually are not being infected. Um, I think there's, there's, there's some limited data uh, that suggests that children are probably at risk. If you look at the Diamond Princess cruise ship, the attack rates among people on that ship who were under the age of 20 were identical to the attack rates overall. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's anecdotal, but that is evidence that, that younger people can be infected. If they can be infected, then schools are probably an environment where the epidemic would be amplified. And if you look at the rate of increase, how quickly do you think the government should move to exploring shutting down schools? Well, I, 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 I think that if you look at places where deaths have occurred, um, which is England now falls into, into that category, a death probably signifies circulation of the virus that's been going on for at least weeks, perhaps more than a month. Uh, because it takes time for people to get sick, it takes time for them to go to the hospital, and it takes time for them to expire. So, so the virus has been circulating here for some time, and I think, I think um, the government does recognize the, uh, the criticality of the situation. I, I, think the, I actually think Chris Whitty and, and his colleagues are, are doing a good job at communicating the risk to the public. I don't think they're minimizing the threat. I think they recognize the potential of the virus um, so overall, and certainly relative to, to some other countries, I, I think the UK is doing a good job. Is there a danger, though, of an overreaction, um, given when you look at the scale of flu deaths worldwide, up to 600,000 a year, and 
you don't shut down public transport networks to stop people getting the flu. I don't think we're dealing with the flu um, here. Uh, WHO, who has looked at this virus most intensively, has looked extremely closely at the experience in China, has, has looked at uh, the mortality rates in China, and has, and has tried to estimate whether there's a lot of undercounting in China, does not feel that we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. They, they as uh, Bruce Aylward, uh, who led that expedition, said, we're, we're seeing the pyramid, actually. So, so the, they think the mortality rate is actually higher than 1%, which if it, if it were even 1%, that would be 10 times the rate of your average seasonal flu. And because this is a virus that is now circulating in a population that has absolutely no immunity to it, you would expect the attack rates to be much higher than the attack rates that we normally see with seasonal flu. So you might have an attack rate that's three times higher than seasonal flu with a mortality rate that's 10 times higher. From what scientists know about this virus so far, what concerns you most about it? I think the most concerning thing about this virus is the combination of infectiousness and the ability to cause severe d disease or death. And we have not since 1918 the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, seen a virus that combined those two qualities in the same way. We have seen very lethal viruses. We have seen uh, certainly Ebola uh, or Nipah or any of the other diseases that CEPI, the organization that I've run, works on. Um, but those viruses have high mortality rates. I mean, Ebola's mortality rate in some settings is greater than 80%, but they don't have the infectiousness that this virus has. They don't have the potential to explode and spread globally. In so other... you fear this could end up being on a scale of the Spanish flu? I, again, I, I don't want to make a prediction because I think what happens with this virus is actually up to us. Uh, I do think this virus has the potential to cause a global pandemic if we're not already there. Uh, and I do think the virus has demonstrated that it has a lethality that is likely many-fold higher than normal flu. And do you believe the WHO figure of 3.4% mortality rate? Because, I mean, the UK puts it at 1%, roughly. In some respects, if, if it is between 1% and 3.4%, it really doesn't matter what's after the decimal point. I think what we're seeing is a virus that is, is many, many times more lethal than flu, and right now a population that is completely vulnerable to it and that we are seeing its ability to explode. I mean, it's increased in, in some countries over the last two weeks, it has increased by 1,000 fold. And many countries are seeing, you know, tenfold or 100 fold increase in cases. And there is nothing to stop that expansion from continuing unless those societies move aggressively, engage their publics, implement multiple public health interventions, including focusing on cases, but also introducing social, social distancing interventions. There's, there's nothing to stop that. Right now, social distancing. I, 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 think, I think everybody should be doing uh, what we call the Ebola handshake, the elbow bump, instead of shaking hands. And we, we did that earlier. We did that earlier. Uh, and and, 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 and I, don't, I don't think we're doing it to be cute. I think we're doing it because we need to modify our behavior. We need to start practicing that now. It Staying may not be... at home, working from home, all of that right now in the UK? I think it, I think it, it may be a, a little bit early to recommend, you know, across the UK, everybody work from home. And there are plenty of people who cannot work from home. And I think we have to recognize that society has to continue, but we do have to modify our behavior in ways that reduces the risk of transmitting the virus. And, 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 and if I could just make one more point on, on that front. One problem that we face as a society when we have a virus that might have a, 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 a fatality rate of 1% or, or possibly even less, it could end up being less, one cha and, and, and that mortality is concentrated in certain parts of the population. One the elderly. The elderly, for example, or the chronically ill, one, one challenge that we face is, is that people who are young and, and generally healthy won't perceive 
personal risk. And, and they'll govern their behavior based on what they perceive their personal risk to be. And I think we need to start thinking in terms of the social risk. I could be, I could be, I, I mean, I am generally healthy. I'm, I'm not that concerned about my own personal risk. But if I then, you know, had a cold or felt like I, you know, had symptoms, but I was well enough to go to work, and I go to work, and I shake hands with my older colleague who's got a chronic medical condition, I could be responsible for that colleague's death. And, and I think we need to all think about our responsibility to each other as we think about how we're going to govern our behavior. We can't view the, uh, you know, the epidemic in terms of our personal risk. We need to act collectively in a cooperative manner. And, and one of the things that Bruce Aylward has, has talked from about- WHO. From WHO. has talked about coming back from uh, the investigation in China is the degree to which the Chinese people have been mobilized against the virus. And he put it in terms of it is like they are at war with the virus. All of society is mobilized in the fight against the virus. And, and Communist I think, country, though. Here, are we too selfish, too capitalist, too globalist to be capable of that kind of I, mobilization? I, I, you know, as, as, an, as an American who has always admired Britain, um, and, and, and particularly, I mean, I, think, I don't think it's a, a crazy analogy to compare this to World War II. The British people have faced much greater threats, and they have come together as a people against much greater threats. I, I think the British people, if they um, came to understand that, that this is something where responsibility sits with everyone, I, I think the British people could, could accomplish what Singapore and Hong Kong have accomplished. Blitz spirit. Blitz spirit, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people might be really surprised, if not sort of vaguely insulted, that you're comparing this to a war, World War II. Well, I, I, I don't, I, WHO is, is using those kinds of terms in talking about what's required to mobilize people. They're, they're using metaphors that are derived from war. And it's because they have seen what this virus is capable of doing. I mean, I mean it, the, the outbreak in Wuhan was clearly a mitigated outbreak. It was mitigated by the incredible sets of interventions that were introduced. And yet, even though it was mitigated, it had not played out to the full extent. It overwhelmed the healthcare system. It caused, I think at this point, it's something like 2,400 deaths in Wuhan. In a normal year in Wuhan, you, you would probably anticipate about 1,500 deaths from flu. This was a mitigated version of this outbreak. It, it could have continued on and, and, and gone to probably several multiples of what actually happened. And you saw the breakdown of the medical care system. You saw people who couldn't receive care, not just for COVID-19, but for any of their other medical conditions. And, and you saw a society that was completely paralyzed. So I don't think that comparing this um, to a war or even to the blitz spirit, I, I, I think that's actually an appropriate analogy. And I think that's the mindset that people need to get into. How worried are you about what's happening in the States with transmission there and I, what the government's doing? I'm, I'm very concerned about the situation in the United States. The US is, is a big country. It's decentralized. Uh, it, it doesn't have a unified uh, national health system. Uh, it doesn't have a unified national public health system. CDC is a, 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 a marvelous institution, but, but a lot of the actual management of public health problems is delegated down to states and local communities. And uh, I, I am concerned that the embedded injustices and inequities in the American system um, will play out uh, that the virus will hit vulnerable Americans, will hit Americans who don't have access to health care, it will hit Americans who don't have health insurance, it will hit Americans who actually depend on the school system to provide meals for their children in a, in a terrible way. Um, the government here has announced funding um, for vac a vaccine or several trial vaccines mm -hmm. um, against the virus. 
Do you agree that there's no hope of securing a vaccine and rolling that out across the population in time for this outbreak? I, it, it depends on what you mean by this outbreak, and, and it depends on how the outbreaks that are taking place actually play out. If the viral transmission can be suppressed through a mobilization of the British public and publics globally, uh, if, 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 if you can convince the publics to look at the success stories and to emulate that, and they can succeed in, in suppressing transmission, then you can buy a lot of time. And it may be the case, I mean, we're all hoping this will be the case, that there may be some reduction of transmission as we get into the summer months, and that buys more time. So I think there is a, a potential that, you know, the, the, that we can keep the virus under some degree of control. I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people that will get sick and a lot of people that will unfortunately die before vaccines become available. Uh, but I do think there is a potential that the delivery of a vaccine, if, 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 if we treat it as a moonshot, if we treat it with the urgency of a wartime mobilization, that we can deliver a vaccine in time to save a lot of lives. I think it's important uh, in, in asking the public to step up and to mobilize in this fight against the virus to understand what those timelines are and to be realistic about it. Um, our timelines, the timelines of, of uh, the NIH in the US and the timelines of, of many knowledgeable vaccine developers, we don't see any way that a vaccine can be available much more rapidly than 12 to 18 months. And, and even if it were to be available in 12 to 18 months, that would literally be you know, the world record for developing and delivering a vaccine. And the vaccine that would become available in 12 to 18 months, the supply would be such that we would need, I think, ethically to prioritize it for those who were at highest risk. We wouldn't have 7 billion doses of vaccine in 12 months. So if this is a war, in your terms, it's a lengthy one? It is a lengthy one. This is a virus that's going to be with us for some time. Um, I'm, there, there are many epidemiologists who think that the virus is likely to become globally endemic and be with us in perpetuity. Uh, if I had to bet, I would think that that is the most probable scenario. So I think it's critical to develop a vaccine as fast as we possibly can. I think we're going to need a vaccine for the long term. I think this virus is going to be with us, even if it were somehow magically to go away. I think this is a virus we're going to be dealing with for years. What do you say to people who say, you know, you, you're using this, these martial metaphors, you're making it sound very scary. You have a vested interest in making people fearful so you get the investment in a vaccine. What do you say to that? I've, I've been working on epidemic preparedness for about 20 years and uh, completely dispassionately without, without elevating the temperature or speaking hyperbolically. Um, this is the most frightening disease I've ever encountered in my career, and that includes Ebola, it includes MERS, it includes SARS. And it's frightening because of the combination of infectiousness and a lethality that is, appears to be many-fold higher than flu. Um, at CEPI, we uh, want to be utterly transparent about what we are doing. We actually are not trying to secure any resources for CEPI's functions. We are only trying to secure resources to make a COVID-19 vaccine. And we've actually said we're, we have a, a fund at the World Bank, so we have oversight by the World Bank. We have said that if funds are allocated into uh, this financial intermediary fund at the World Bank, and for whatever reason, the, the virus magically goes away, the pandemic comes and goes, and the virus disappears, you know, the world decides that it doesn't need a vaccine. We, we are happy to restore any unspent funds to the investors. Uh, we're, we're not trying to profit from this. In fact, we want to be very organizationally modest about what we're doing, and we want to be an instrument of the global will.